So um, actually, this is the question I wanted to ask. So who here has heard of blockchain? But let's uh, a second question before we start. Who would be comfortable enough to explain blockchain on a stage? Could you raise your hands? OK. Not so many. So this is what we've been seeing in this last year. Blockchain has become a buzzword. A lot of people have heard of blockchain, uh, but the knowledge about blockchain is very limited. So I'm hoping to um, unveil some myths or, or information here today. So basically, blockchain is a technology that rests on top of the current internet and will allow us to have peer-to-peer -peer transactions without the middleman. Blockchain is the driving technology behind the next generation internet, the so-called decentral web, because we're disintermediating and getting rid of the middleman. But in order to understand the future of the internet, I think it's uh, very important to go briefly go back in time and understand where computers come from and how we got here and why blockchain is as disruptive as it is. So, First, computers were very big, not quite powerful, but expensive. And eventually, as computers became smaller, in the 80s, we saw the revolution of the personal computer. Computers became smaller, cheaper, more accessible, and they spread around the world. But even though many, many households started to have computers, uh, most of these computers, until the late 80s, were not connected to each other. Most of these computers were standalone. Uh, some were connected, most weren't. Until the early 90s, when we saw the rise of the internet. Um, and we had two killer applications. One was email, revolutionized communication. The second was the World Wide Web, which revolutionized information. And what we've seen in the last 25 years is more and more computers connecting to each other. First the big ones, then the small ones, then mobile devices, and now we have reached the stage of IoT, connecting machine-to-machine um, -machine communication over this one single internet protocol. Why am I saying this? Why is this important? Because even though we have more and more devices connected to each other over this internet protocol, the logic is based on one principle, that two computers are connected to each other, while one is a server where the data is hosted, and the other is the client um, accessing, asking, and reading and writing data from this computer from this other server. And this is what we call client-server technology. Computers are connected via the IP protocol. Why is that important? Because even though we live in this interconnected world, data storage until today is still local. So it's local on the computer itself, no matter their size. It's local even though it's in the cloud, somewhere remote. Storage is still local. And it's local on the removable devices that have undergone rapid change over the years. But data storage is local. Why is that maybe a problem? Because it raises question of data security. It raises question of who owns data, who owns my data, privacy. And it raises question of who manages that data, transaction verification, and can I trust those entities who are managing my data? So it boils down to one question, the question of trust. And I guess this is why last year The Economist uh, featured, had a feature article on blockchain, and they called the blockchain the trust machine. Because what blockchain technology in the end does, it decentralizes trust. And it allows us to move away from the client-server technology that we know today, which you could describe as information and data monarchy, to a new paradigm of data democracy over peer-to-peer -peer systems. And this is why it's important to understand the history of computing, because we first had the computer, then we had the internet. So our whole logic of how to manage data is based on the idea of standalone computers. And blockchain and other technologies that are building on top and around it is for the first time questioning this paradigm of structuring data based on the notion of standalone computers. 
So, as I said, it allows us to have peer-to-peer -peer transactions without a middleman. How? And without going into too much technical detail, it's important to understand that blockchain itself is not a completely new technology per se. It combines a set of technologies we've known for a while, namely the idea of peer-to-peer -peer systems, where you have a peer-to-peer -peer network of computers where each node in the network is client as well as server, with the notion of um, a cryptography that ensures data privacy as well as transparency at the same time, and game theoretical aspects that allow this peer-to-peer -peer network of computers to work. Um, so basically, blockchain itself is just a giant spreadsheet. You can think of it like a spreadsheet in the sky, for example, a Google Docs document that every Body can access, read and write to, and it's documented who wrote which information into that document at what time. Only that blockchain is not centrally stored. A copy of that Excel sheet is stored on the different nodes of the network. It's a shared, public, and trusted ledger of transactions that each participant in the network can ins inspect and write to, but no single user controls. So in the future, or now already, Bitcoin is the first application of blockchain. Transactions are not validated through one central entity, for example, through a trusted third party like a bank. Um, you can decentralize trust by having a peer-to-peer -peer network of computers confirming transactions by majority decision, because every node in the network has the same information. Okay, this is the important part. So far, we've been a bit abstract. Blockchain, in the end, can be seen this peer-to-peer -peer network and I'm using analogies here, is a decentralized world computer. The protocol can be seen as like the operating system on top of it. And what you can do with blockchain, and that's the game changer, you can start building smart contracts on top of it. A smart contract uh, is like a digital handshake. Um, it's not a legal contract. It could be in the future. And it's not very smart, but it's auto-enforceable. Um, it's kind of a piece of code where the rules of the game are predefined in that code. You can see it. Um, the analogy would be the chessboard manager. In chess, you have a set of rules. And when two people play chess, the chessboard manager at the tournament would make sure that the players can only perform actions according to the rules predefined. And if they try and make a move that it's not allowed, the chessboard manager would intervene, sanction it, and not allow it. The smart contract works exactly like that. But as opposed to paper contracts that are signed by hand, smart contracts are pieces of code that are signed with a cryptographic public uh, private key. Only that the key obviously doesn't look like that, but like this. Smart contracts per se are not a new idea. Um, this machine is a primitive form of a smart contract. The rule of the game are ingrained into the machine. You only get a certain product if you dial the number, put enough money, and if you don't, you don't get the product. And if the machine has run out of the product, you uh, would get your money back. This is how a smart contract works. And this is how we can bypass the middleman, because uh, it is auto-enforceable. Um, this intermediate is the big word. And basically, you can think of blockchain as this decentralized world computer where you now can build any kind of smart contract or decentralized application running on top of this computer on it. So the question I get very often is, which smart contracts, um, uh, which uh, blockchains exist. So obviously, a lot of you know that the first blockchain in that sense was the Bitcoin blockchain. And um, Bitcoin, the idea behind Bitcoin was to have money without banks, to have a ex value exchange protocol where you could send money from A to B when A and B don't know each other, bypassing the need of a bank. 
So the smart contract in the blockchain, Bitcoin blockchain makes sure that A really has the money and B really receives the money and that A is not double spending the money at the same time. This is usually the role of the bank in the smart contract. You get rid of the necessity for a bank. And so Bitcoin was the first blockchain eight years ago, but since the uh, code is open source, many people took this code and started experimenting and asking themselves the question, why don't we take that idea of a blockchain and try and build other kind of value transactions on top of it, not only sending money from A to B. And what came out, one of the most interesting applications nowadays of, uh, or blockchains nowadays, is Ethereum. Because Ethereum took that original idea, but decoupled the blockchain from the smart contract layer. Uh, and, and said, let's build a world computer where we can build any kind of decentralized application powered by smart contracts on top of it. So uh, a big chunk of the team is sitting here in Berlin. So Ethereum is really an interesting project, and the first applications are being built. Um, the next thing that happened, financial institutions mainly, but big companies came and said, well, we like the idea of public blockchains, but we don't want to have a public blockchain. What if we take the idea of a distributed ledger and build something like a private blockchain or a consortium blockchain where we can control the members of this distributed network? So nowadays, when people talk about blockchains, they mean different things. And we will talk about this on a panel a bit later, but this is a very important thing to know. To round it up and to get into the hands-on, into the use cases, what use cases do we have nowadays for blockchain? So obviously, I guess most of you have heard of the myriad of financial technology use cases that we have. Bitcoin, more or less, is the first application of blockchain, much like email was the first application of the internet in the 90s. And so far, it was the only killer application. And soon we will see much more, but financial technologies are a big use case, and big banks are now creating their own consortia. Another use case is e-government. Anything where you need a registry, anything where you need a public database, like, for example, land registries, could be a use case, and the first governments are already building solutions on top of that. Notaries. Um, online notaries for goods of value that usually would be too expensive to kind of register in some kind of registry. On the, bit, on the blockchain, this becomes faster, cheaper, and more accessible. Internet of Things, machine-to-machine -machine communication, uh, smart access control. These are all use cases for the blockchain. Accounting, doesn't sound sexy, but in the long run, we will see an accounting revolution. Why? Because blockchain enables us to have auditing on the fly. Blockchain enables us to um, prevent cooking of the books. It gets rid of human error, and it will enable us to pay taxes on the fly. Um, supply chain, this is also, and we'll talk about that later, it will need some depth effects, but supply chain is a, a good use case because of disintermediation, transparency, and the provenance of goods. This is not theory. We already have the first startups, and I'm just uh, calling a few names here. Slocket is a German-based company doing smart user access control for machine-to-machine -machine communication and uh, the sharing economy, making it cheaper uh, and uh, lowering the transaction costs. Ascribe, also a Berlin-based company, building kind of uh, uh, online registry for uh, art, artworks for creators, where you can upload your art and timestamp it and pass on the rights to that goods uh, much cheaper and much um, faster then it would be normally possible. OK? Provenance, we'll talk about this later, is dealing with the question of where the provenance of goods. Uh, is, is it made in Germany? If it says it's made in Germany, is it fair trade? If it says it's fair trade, on the blockchain, we will have an unbroken chain of custody of that information. Music industry. Big applications are building on top of that. Uh, there are, most of these things are still in prototype stage, but uh, it will make uh, more transparency, uh, immediate um, 
data flow and immediate payment of artists will be possible on the blockchain. Prediction markets, betting markets, gambling on the blockchain, uh, where we have trustless trust, this is disrupting the, the whole industry. And last but not least, oh, that's not even the last one. One of the claims of blockchain is disrupt the disruptors. And um, Arcade City is trying to disrupt Uber by having decentralized application, uh, having and enabling ride sharing without Uber. Insurance industry will see a lot of use cases, and this is coming up too. To round it up, time is running out. Um, if we look at blockchain and the scope of the history of the internet, as I said, in the 90s, we had the World Wide Web. It revolutionized information. Ten years later, we had the so-called Web 2. It brought us the programmable web. And it enabled us to have more complex application on top of the internet, bringing us social media on one hand and the sharing economy on the other hand. But it was a peer-to-peer -peer economy, or it is a peer economy, always with the middlemen. Uber, Airbnb, you have these huge platforms with a lot of market power on top, uh, in the middle of this peer-to-peer -peer economy. So blockchain, in this timeline, can be seen as the Web3 where you have peer-to-peer -peer transactions without the middleman. With blockchain, you can decentralize the web in a much greater way than it's decentralized today. But it's not only blockchain. There is a set of adjacent technologies like IPFS. Data storage on the blockchain is too slow and too expensive. So there are other technologies that we use for that. And we're in the very, very early stages of that development. Um, Blockchain has all the potential, I believe, what people talk about, but a lot of these things won't come tomorrow uh, because we're still working on scalability, the speed of transactions on the blockchain, identity and privacy. We don't know what decentralized business models could look like. Uh, it's like in the early 90s, people didn't know how you would make money putting an article online. Right? So this is very similar to back then. Training and education and information is still a challenge. And we're still building the protocol layer. The core technology is moving very fast right now. Um, as an outlook, as I said, it, it's like 1990s for the internet. We don't know if blockchain will be the end or just the beginning. And whatever comes next year and we'll build on top of it. But I'm fairly confident to say that blockchain will enable us to have a more decentralized internet. And if you want more information, go on blockchainhub.net. We have a vast set of information resources, especially geared towards people who are new to the topic. Follow us on social media. Uh, follow me personally on social media. And if you have information, we'll still be here. And after that, in the speaker's corner. Thanks.